today's date of the agenda. First, the council will vote on two Article 11 property tax exemptions. The first exemption is needed uh, at 645 Bruce Avenue in Councilor Robert Koenig's district, uh, which supports the construction of 112 units of affordable housing. The second exemption located at 90 Sand Street in Councilmember Le Stephen Levy's district supports the preservation of 508 units of affordable housing. It's a big project. It's actually a very exciting project. Um, and uh, please uh, vote for that one. Up next, the council's going to vote on the following land use items. They're going to vote on the Landmark Preservation Commission's application for designation of the Coney Island Lieberman Boardwalk as a scenic landmark in Council Member Mark Sager's district. Councilman Sager has been a leader on this issue for years, and Councilman Joyce has been a part of this as well. We'll be voting on applications for Article 11 tax exemptions for two properties that were included in Round 10 of the Third Party Transfer Program. The tax exemptions will facilitate their removal from the Third Party Transfer Program. The first exemption uh, for the property is the property located at 490 East 181st Street in Councilor Richie Ward's district would facilitate the preservation of 24 units of affordable housing. The second exemption is a property located at 1102 Franklin Avenue in Council Member Mark Gibson's district. It would facilitate the preservation of 20 units of affordable housing. The next one the council will vote on is the uh, Department of Housing Preservation and Development's application for an Article 11 tax exemption would facilitate the preservation of 269 units of affordable housing located in Council Member Mark Sager's district. The council is also going to be voting on Sidewalk Cafe, located at 223 Dyson Street in Council Member Mark Sager's district. Next on the agenda, the council will vote on the following pieces of legislation and resolutions. We are going to vote on Resolution 469, sponsored by my friend who's here, Council Member Carlino Rivera, which calls on the U.S. Congress uh, to pass and the President to sign the Keep Families Together Act to immediately stop the Department of Homeland Security from taking children from their parents at the U.S. border, the, except with express direction from a valid grounds by expert and for additional legislation that would end family detention that is unsafe and is harmful to our country. My friend, Council Member Carlino Rivera, you have the seat of honor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, as you all may have been witness to atrocities and horrible experiences at our border. Uh, while we have leaders in Congress, and even leaders here in New York City who know that we can do better and we must do better, I think as a council we must send a message to Washington saying how important this issue is to us. We have some of these children here and we are working hard to make sure that they are reunited with their families. But we must, as a nation, come together and we are asking Congress to pass the Keep Families Together Act and I'm so proud to have support on this resolution. It was an incredibly uh, moving and transformative hearing, and I am glad that we were able to pass it here today. Thank you. Certainly. Um, next, the council uh, may uh, disapprove the transfer of any property within 45 days of receiving official notice from the Department of Finance of a list of properties scheduled to go through the third party transfer program. Uh, this round of third party transfers involves property in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. The council will vote on disapproving this transfer. We'll, we'll disapprove, we'll, we'll be voting on the disapproval of the transfer of properties to council member Ines Barron, Max Gucci, Nancy Gibson, Andy Kuhn, and Fernando Cabrera Jr. Uh, the council is also gonna be voting on a bill related to senior center reporting and one related to health inspections at senior centers and social health day care centers. Introduction 411A, sponsored by Council Member Margaret Chin, would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to conduct health inspections at senior centers and social health day care centers that are considered food service establishments under New York City Health Code and to publish those inspection results online. Council Member Chin is not able to join us here today, but I understand she has some other work on this bill. The other bill that I just mentioned uh, and uh, Council Member Carvalone is Introduction 399B, which would require the Department of the Aging annually to report to the speaker and post on its website and provide data about the participants, programming, services, costs, and budgets at each of the district's 249 senior centers 
just me and Andrew for time, and then we don't have to have a conversation with each other. And so I'm really grateful that our company of Malone could afford to share time with all of you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You pretty much summed it up. It's, it's the hearings that result in these important stories because when we advocating for our seniors in our district ask for information from the agency as to what's going on in any particular one area, here we have senior centers where we don't have this critical information. How can we do budgets? How can we do education? How can we do programs uh, and senior advocacy if we don't have the data as to what's going on in each and every senior credit credit union center of almost 250 in the city? We don't have the budgets. We don't have the, the breakdown of all those critical resources. So that's what um, 399B does. And I, I, I thank everybody who worked with our, our agent, uh, Sharon Wanda Kim, because she's been amazing with this. So a quick fact, by, by 2040, uh, one in every five New Yorkers will be 60 or older. So if you don't <laughs> get it today, there's more concerns by our senior citizens who either will wait and wait. And that's why 399B is so important. Call it one zip code. Department of the Aging's report on the metrics including services, costs, and utilization rates of senior centers in New York City, uh, not only for transparency but for a better understanding in the hopes that we can help adequately provide these critical services to the population of New York. So we work hand in hand with our seniors by creating and utilizing this program to ensure seniors can benefit outreach from districts throughout our organizations throughout the city. Uh, so I'd like to thank Loretta Coker, Christine O'Brien for his support, our city employees, Rebecca Kelly, my staff, staff uh, John Kinshot, Mike Jones, Michael Jarrett, and of course, Speaker Johnson for making sure this great trip goes smoothly. Thank you. Uh, next, the council will vote on introduction 1572 of Mary Child, Sunday edition of Mary Child, uh, the Sunday Metro, uh, which would reduce the diminished capacity of reducible solid waste in New York organic matter from non reducible solid waste used for transportation sewer over for a certificate it's more complicated than that uh, but I'm going to let Councilmember Lesher explain it and congratulate him for the long 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 road that started before he and I were elected to the City Council but it was a big day for these communities across the city and the future of how we handle waste and the environmental justice day and the fellow workers so I'm very very proud of this one and I have five pages, so I'm going to try to get try to get down to two. Uh, the first thing I want to do is thank Speaker Corey Johnson. Um, it's been three speakers uh, since this legislation was introduced uh, by Council then Council Member Diana Reyna. Uh, it's been extremely difficult to put over uh, as a as a line or a threshold, um, and it was because Speaker Johnson uh, came out in support of it against all odds. He just said, "I'm going to support it. We're going to push this through." And we finally got it over the finish line and we are here today. Um, so I want to just thank you. I know a lot of council members thank you for every time we're here um, related to your bill, but you truly made a difference in this one. I want to just, again, thank you for that. <laughs> I mean it. Um, the United States has a long history of racism that has manifested itself in a whole host of ugly ways throughout our history. Environmental racism has been a particularly insidious method through which historically disadvantaged communities have been made to suffer because of the color of their skin. The notion that black and brown people are somehow less deserving of a safe and clean environment represents some of the very most worst tendencies within our society. In my district, we have suffered with toxic conditions created by decades of heavy industrial usage, oil spills, and the reason I am speaking today the highest concentration of waste transfer stations in the city. These transfer stations attract thousands of trucks to my community, spewing toxic fumes into air on their way to dump. Our children breathe these fumes from birth. Woodhull Hospital, which serves my district, has the highest rate of emission for asthma of any hospital in the city of New York. Our seniors have to dodge 40-ton trucks barreling down our streets at high speeds. 72-year-old Leah Clark of the Bronx was killed in one of these encounters just a few months ago. How can a city that prides itself on productive policies, a city that has committed itself to rigorously protecting its environment in the face of hostile federal government, po possibly allow a system like this to exist? 
how can I, the individual subject to the first and first and foremost, protect the health and welfare of my constituents? Look at a kid from the south side in the eye and say, I care, child. Today we are out. Intro 167 will finally provide the communities of North Brooklyn, South Bronx, and Southeast Queens a measure of relief and security. Furthermore, it will ensure that no other community in the city of New York can ever be like mine. It is not fair that North Brooklyn processes 38% of the city's trash. Just as it wouldn't be fair if we had 38% of the city's parks or 38% of the city's affordable housing stock for that matter. Basic equity. My constituents know that our community will continue to process to process the most trash in the city in the city for the foreseeable future. We're simply at, we're simply asking that others step up to do their part. I want to give a big, big thank you again to Speaker Corey Johnson, to Councilmember Diana Reyna, to Steve Levin, my co-prime sponsor, uh, to my council colleagues that are supporting this legislation, Cesaro from the Progressive Caucus, and to the great Sanitation Committee staff, Nicole, Nadia, John, and Kevin, who dealt with all the changes of the bill and has gone through, um, that it, it has gone through. My former legislative director, Lacey Calvert, who put in four years of work into making this a reality, to the advocates of the Teamsters, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, the New York Village of Public Interest, John Green Research, the Fresh Council, groups in my district, Outrage, um, who I will let you know that I will thank for in when we when we vote, as well as Sarah Peters and many other groups who have testified. Um, Kira Feldman, who broke the sanitation solvent chain, and Danielle Muro, um, who tracked this bill's progress in the city council, um, to Errol Lewis, who uh, our New York One made this an issue for the past week. Um, and again, Corey Johnson, showing an incredible amount of integrity, character of character and leadership in getting us to this point. Without your commitment, environmental justice and patient service, this bill would not be, this bill would be languishing in committee. Uh, I want to extend my heartfelt thank you again to the residents of North Brooklyn who have been in the front lines of this injustice uh, for far too long. Uh, and finally, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the memory of Marcel Diallo. Marcel was a 21-year-old Guinean immigrant who worked for Sanitation Salvage in the Bronx, spending his nights doing dangerous and backbreaking work on shifts that could last up to 16 hours for a mere $40 a day. Marcel was killed by the truck he was working on last November, but rather than taking responsibility for this tragedy, the company he worked for, Sanitation Salvage, engaged in a cover-up. The appalling circumstances of Mark Tar's death have finally galvanized the city to bring real reform to this industry. Intro 157 is the first step in this effort and will ensure that Mark Tar's death will not be in vain. Now, again, would like to thank all of my colleagues for their support. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Got the chills, you talking about that. It's so important. Um, the council is also gonna vote on two bills today that will ensure transparency for consumers when dealing with the bail bond industry. These bills require bail bond agents to make certain crucial disclosures to consumers before signing a contract. In addition to requiring signed copies of all documents to be provided to consumers and informing consumers how to file a complaint against a bail bond agent, my bill, Introduction 724A, would require bail bond businesses to provide consumers with a consumer bill of rights, which will explain key terms and inform consumers on legal protections when dealing with a bail bond agent. Introduction 510B, sponsored by Councilman Roy Lansman, who's here, would require bail bond businesses to conspicuously post signage, disclosing the maximum the bond agent may charge the premium in addition to other information related to prohibited fees. These bills will seek to help consumers at their most vulnerable time, often a position of trying to keep their loved ones from being incarcerated. I want to invite Councilmember Lamson to come up and speak on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. I am proud to stand here today in support of my bill, Intro 510, <clears throat> to require commercial bail bond agents to give consumers specific information about their rights under city and state law, including a list of the maximum amounts that a bail bondsman can charge in fees. The City Controller's Office estimates that uh, last year, more than 12,300 people in New York City turned to commercial bail bonds businesses 
to get their loved ones out of jail and paid between $16 million and $27 million in non-refundable fees to do so. This is even as the numbers of people at Rikers Island has dropped, the number of private bail bond posters has grown by 12%. It goes without saying that people who are desperate to get their loved ones out of Rikers to sign contracts, pay premiums, and put down collateral, often without realizing what laws regulate those companies or are intended to protect them as consumers. And desperate people are prime targets for the unscrupulous and the predatory. While bail bondsmen are legally required to limit the amount they charge in fees, many exceed those caps or add on other illegal fees and charges, such as bogus courier fees, to boost their profits. Today, this council will take a step forward toward treating bail bonds as the dangerous consumer financial product they have always been. Very simply, Intro 510 will require bail bond businesses to conspicuously post the rules they are required to follow, making sure consumers know the maximum that companies can charge for their services, know that they will be entitled to receive a bill of rights, and know about their right to make a complaint and direct regulatory attention towards bad actors. I'd like to thank Rafael Espinal, Chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs, and Balkis Mihiric and Rachel Cordero, who worked so hard on this legislation. Thank you. This is a big deal. Uh, this is an industry that for far too long has been unregulated and has been able to take advantage of a lot of people. And I think these bills today are going to start to reform the industry, and I'm really proud of these bills. Moving on, uh, council, uh, the council will vote on introduction uh, 981A, sponsored again by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, which will provide the city with an additional tool to enforce the laws against illegal short-term rentals throughout the five boroughs. I want to invite Councilmember Rivera to return to the podium and to speak on this bill. Hello again, everyone. So I'm so proud that one of the first pieces of legislation I'll be tapping as a council member is going to go towards something uh, that is incredibly important to me and that I have years of experience working for, and that is the preservation of affordable housing. Intro 981 will finally give our city the enforcement capabilities it needs to crack down on the bad acting landlords who for years illegally converted countless apartments, many of them rent regulated, starving our low income housing stock. Before I ran for office, I worked as a housing organizer and I wasn't sure this day would ever come. But the voices of progressive advocates and working class New Yorkers have finally broken through and of course honoring the leadership of the speaker, I am so proud to be joined by 43 members of the council on this bill who have heard from their constituents, who have heard from tenant leaders that this bill is desperately needed and who co-sponsored early on as in the timeline of this bill. So I want to thank the speaker, of course, uh, my colleagues who stood on the forefront with me, who stood there uh, time and time again in the rallies and taking the constant constituent calls that we would get about illegal hotels operating. My neighborhood, where I grew up, the Lower East Side East Village, is ground zero for this type of illegal operation. And so I want to just thank all the New Yorkers who came to the rallies, who made phone calls, who sent emails, and never gave up against billion-dollar industries who instead use their resources, instead of giving over the data, which they could, now we will mandate that they turn over that data to the Office of Special Enforcement so we can make sure that we're rooting out the people who are taking away our housing stock. So I'm going to continue to fight to give our working class New Yorkers and small business operators a fighting chance. And this bill is so, so important to me. I can't thank you enough, uh, Mr. Speaker. You, we talked about this on my campaign. Um, this is happening all over the city. This bill is about transparency and bringing accountability to billion dollar companies who are not being good neighbors. We studied legislation from all over the world, from San Francisco to Barcelona, to make sure that we got it right. I'm very, very proud of the version that we are passing today, and I want to thank everyone for their support. Thank you. Congratulations, thank you. Carlina. Uh, next, we're going to vote on introduction 779A, sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards, which will require the Department of Correction to issue quarterly reports on the use of devices capable of administering an electric shock 
We're primarily talking about tasers. Councilmember Richards isn't here, uh, but I want to congratulate him on this bill. Finally, we're going to vote on another bill of mine, Introduction 741A. I'm really proud of this bill. It's going to prohibit the city from collecting revenue from people incarcerated in our city jails for making phone calls and require the city to provide all domestic calls at no cost to those incarcerated and no cost to the people who they are calling. Unfortunately, the city has been profiting from some of our most vulnerable New Yorkers for years, and that is going to stop. People who are locked up in our city's jails because they've been convicted, convicted of a minor crime, or far more often because they and their families can't afford to pay their bail, have been paying both the city and private companies to make phone calls, and they've been paying the amount of almost $8 million a year. Families and friends of incarcerated individuals should not have to choose between hearing from their loved ones and paying their bills just because they can't afford to pay for overpriced phone calls. Studies have shown that enabling people in jail to stay in touch with their communities improves outcomes and reduces recidivism. 85% of people in our jails right now in New York City are black or Hispanic. More than 80% of them have not been convicted of any charges against them. And the rest of them, most of them, are serving their time for misdemeanor offenses and will be returning to the community in weeks or in months. Most of them cannot afford the high fees the city has been charging for all but a few calls provided for free to those who the city con considers indigent. The bill that we are passing today, my bill, would stop the city from overcharging them uh, for staying in touch with the people they need the support from through these difficult times. In fact, not only are we going to stop the city from profiting off of them, we are all also making all domestic calls for individuals who are in custody completely free, because that is the right thing to do. We want people to be able to stay in touch with their communities, with their families and their loved ones, with their employers, with support programs, with their lawyers, just as those who can afford to pay bail are able to do so from the comfort of their homes while they await trial. This is a common sense bill that rights a wrong that has been going on for far too long. And that concludes our very slow agenda for this July stated meeting of the City Council, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. So first, let's take questions uh, on topic on, on, the, on the bills that we talked about uh, today, and then I'm happy to take off topic. Uh, Rosa. Um, on topic, uh, Airbnb has called this bill pop politics. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have a response to that. I think we sent out a quote in response to it, but I'm also happy to respond to it today, and of course, let uh, Council Member Vera, whose bill this is, respond. You know, I've said this before, I have been working on this bill long before uh, I ever decided to run for city council. When I was on my local community board, community board four, my district has more Airbnb listings than any other district in the entire city. And if you look at some of the takedowns that the Office of Special Enforcement has been able um, to adjudicate and get enough evidence on, there was a major takedown in Hell's Kitchen six weeks ago. There was a major takedown a block from my apartment earlier this year. So as Carlina said, her district is ground zero for many of these problems. My district is ground zero. And this came out of us getting many, many complaints from constituents and residential buildings, whether they be rental buildings, co-op buildings, condo buildings, uh, that were dealing with the consequences of short-term rentals and what it meant. There have been studies on this that have looked at it. This has been done on the merits. And they are trying to mix the fact that there is a union, the Hotel Trades Council, who has supported people in the past. But I was working on these issues even before I even knew what the Hotel Trades Council was. Before I even knew the name the Hotel Trades Council, I had worked on this issue for years earlier. So to, to mix all of that together is patently unfair. And clearly, they are lashing out because they lost a policy argument um, on this very issue. So I am proud of the bill we're passing today. It's about transparency, it's accountability, and I think this is the right thing to do, and I want to let Carlina speak on this. Yes, I, I agree with everything said uh, by the speaker. They're deciding to focus on optics that are convenient to their own message, and they want to continue to focus on their own profit. 
So I, I agree this is something that we've been wanting to do for a long time. The Office of Special Enforcement was established in 2006, so this bill is actually overdue. Corey's been working on this issue. I have been working on this issue as a housing organizer and someone who worked in my community providing direct services around housing. Mm -hmm. And I would hear horror story after horror story. It is a housing issue. It is a public safety issue. And I'm very proud to be passing this bill. Are you offended by bellhop politics? Certain <laughs> they put my picture on a piece of paper and gave it out. It said wanted. There was a lot of tactics that they used to try to, I think, offend us and scare us into not passing this bill. But Corey and I have pretty thick skin, so do my colleagues in the city council. And um, whether they were trying to intimidate me or not, it didn't work. So I want to say, I want to respond to that. So one thing I want to remind people of, because uh, Carlina is too maybe humble to say it, you know, before she ran for the council, she was the chief organizer for one of the most prominent housing groups in the city of New York, Goals, good old Lower East Side. So she had worked for years organizing low-income tenants, NYCHA residents, people in communities that were changing and seeing the effects of short-term rentals and what it was doing. So she had a history of working on this long before she came to the city council, but it's in, I guess it's inconvenient of them to be able to point that out and talk about that. On the bellhop politics, I mean, I'm not offended by it, but I actually think it's a nasty thing to say about bellhops. <laughs> well, are they trying to like denigrate people who are bellhops? I mean, there are plenty of bellhops in New York City who are immigrants. There are plenty of bellhops in New York City who are trying to make a good life for themselves and for their families. There are plenty of bellhops in New York City who work long hours. So. You know, to throw that in here to try to insult us, you're not insulting us. You are in some way insulting hardworking New Yorkers who are not making a tremendous amount of money uh, to try to score political points. And it's cheap, and you know, it might be a nice sound bite, but it's not why we do the things we do here. Katie? So again, I'll let Carlina answer, but, uh, but I would just say that we, the, the state controls the multiple dwelling law, which created this in the first place, a Liz Kruger and Dick Gottfried bill that was created many years ago through the legislature and the governor signed it into law, which is what set up the regulatory framework that we're working in now. We don't touch that, we don't change that. All we are asking for is for transparency, so that for a building in Hell's Kitchen that I referenced earlier, it should not take 18 months to two years for OSC to get the information they need to then figure out that 26 
information on this, typically they go out in a, in a response-based way. They go out when there have been complaints or multiple complaints made about a single apartment or a building. They're not going out combing the entire city. There are tens of thousands of listings on the website. They actually don't have the personnel to do that. So they respond based off of complaints that are made, um, and so that's all I know on it. Uh, Matt? Uh, do you do you know how long the data will be retained? We have staff here. We can get back to you on it. If, if there is no cap, why is there no cap? I didn't understand. I don't understand if your question. There's no cap on the uh, time the data will be retained. Why is there no cap? I don't know. Okay, that's the second question. What do you think if Airbnb uh, business goes down in your city? Is that bad or good for the city? It's, that's not about that. I mean, it's, uh, I don't really have an opinion on that. We're not doing this to to help them or hurt them. We're doing it because we try to make common sense regulations here based off of concerns we hear from the public. So, um, I, I, yeah, I don't know how it's going to affect their business, and that's not yeah. why we do things here. We're not, other cities where they have passed similar legislation, Airbnb's thriving and they're doing well. Henry, did you have a question? <coughs> Well, I think it's a little uh, chicken or egg. What I mean by that is the Hotel Trades Council uh, endorsed me in 2013 when I ran for the city council the first time. I didn't have a previous relationship with them. I had been working on these issues related to illegal hotels in Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen when I was on the local community board at that point for seven or eight years. And part of the reason they supported me was because I was already working on the issue. It wasn't like they plucked me out of thin air, supported me, and then said to me, now that we supported you, you need to support our issues in this way. I had a track record and history of working on those issues. So they and supported I, you because you had already demonstrated That I was inconsistent or consistent? That I was consistent. consistent. Well, I, I, so they were rewarding you, if you will. I don't know. Supporting you for your past efforts that were consistent. There are lots of there are lots of people, whether it be unions, elected officials, community organizations, democratic clubs. There's a panoply of stakeholders in New York City who make endorsements in elections. They are one of those folks that that do that, um, and. Um, I feel very comfortable because I know what my track record was long before I even knew who their names were. I had been working on these issues. So my position, there's no way, and I say this very respectfully, there's no way for me to be able, first of all, New York City is unlike any other city. But second, the hotel industry is powerful in San Francisco. They are. San Francisco is a very powerful hotel industry and a very powerful hotel union. Very. Las Vegas has the most powerful hotel union in the in the entire country, the Culinary Workers Union. So they, they, they deals. They, they, they what I I don't know what happened there. I don't know. I haven't I haven't called the president of the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco and said, how did you do this and how did we not do it? Every city's different. Every state has different laws which inform what municipalities can and can't do. So there's no analogy on what exactly other municipalities have done uh, given what we have done. But if you want to outlaw plastic bags, you go to the jurisdiction and find out how did you do 
we, the city has requested this data from Airbnb for years. For years. So if they're not gonna give us the data, how do you make a deal? We have, if you go and look, there was a residential building, rent regulated units in Hell's Kitchen, close to Times Square, which was almost all illegal Airbnb listings these are the type of buildings that we're looking at. Illegal hotels where they're warehousing apartments. The vacancy rate in New York City is very low on apartments. We're in an affordable housing crisis. We're in a homelessness crisis. And Airbnb will not give us this data. They won't get, so they say, oh, we're, we're removing illegal listings on our own. They didn't remove those listings. They didn't remove the listings a block from where I live where they took down another building. So I don't, Henry, I don't know how you craft a deal if the company that you're trying to regulate will not give you any information. What, their, what they keep saying their solution to this is, is we have a Lentol bill and a Republican sponsored bill in the state legislature. They, they said it last night in New York One. We have a bill in the state legislature and that's how we wanna fix this. So they, haven't wa they didn't want any type of deal. They didn't wanna work with us. They didn't wanna give over information. Their only path they keep saying is, we wanna to go to the state legislature and change the multiple dwellings law. So I actually don't think it's really on us. We've tried, we've had conversations, we've had meetings, the staff ran the bills by them, the staff tried to get input from them, they weren't forthcoming. They, they see their path is going to the state legislature and changing the multiple dwellings law. What, I don't know what their concerns are. What are their concerns? So I, I mean, I want to give you the correct information on this because I had the same question about this, not knowing that NICLU had weighed in. So, the, so the let me let me uh, let me let me give you some information on it. So the. I can't talk about NICLU, and I really respect NICLU and Donna Lieberman, so uh, that's a separate thing. But the privacy claim that Airbnb has been making on the bill about the, the folks who put their listings up is sort of disingenuous. I mean, the council takes privacy concerns very seriously, and the reason why it is disingenuous is because last year, this city council and the mayor signed into law two comprehensive bills regulating how the city of New York gathers, maintains, and keeps secure personal information that it has. We did this with regard to in, uh, immigration data. We did this in regard to other data that the city collects. And so the council a year ago passed two bills about protecting New Yorkers' data that the city collects to be able to ensure a level of privacy that protects those individuals. Again, Airbnb knew this. We gave them this information, but it falls outside of their line of talking points, and so they don't mention it when they have conference calls insult insulting bellhops. But NICLU disagrees. They still oh, I don't know about the NICLU concerns. I mean, I'm happy to talk to Donna Lieberman about NICLU. I can't do that here. I, I, I really respect Donna, and, I, and I agree with her on a lot. Go ahead. I have to go to a press conference. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions about for Antonio on his? Sorry. Come, on, come on up. Sorry about that. Antonio, you want to answer questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the changes from the original version of the yeah. bill, why they were made, and you know, how at all you think it will change the effectiveness of this? Um, so what we noticed in uh, the cha uh, change we made was uh, the amount of reduction of permitted capacity that would happen uh, in all districts would have been 50%. Instead, we made it so that it's 33% in the Bronx and 33% in Queens, um, and 50% in Brooklyn. Brooklyn has an exponentially uh, or larger uh, permanent capacity than those two neighborhoods combined. And because of the severity of the issue in North Brooklyn, we thought a larger cut would make more sense. Another thing we did was uh, exempt rail uh, transfer stations that have rail yards in them. What we want to do is encourage uh, any transportation or movement of trash by uh, companies that have 
rail, barge, um, and you know, non-environment or, or environmentally friendly options. Uh, and we're also encouraging recycling, where we're giving people 20% more capacity if it's solely uh, up to solely address the recycling issue. So if you're doing good recycling and your rates are really high, you're going to be able to have more capacity here in the city of New York. Those are the changes we made. We want to encourage good behavior, um, discourage bad behavior, and then ultimately having a bigger cut in Brooklyn because we have so much more trash than anyone else. Oh, yes. So that, that's intro, I want to say, 69 with Councilmember Diana Reyna, about nine, no, it's the same bill, but it's been modified, I believe, I want to say eight to nine times since then. Her original legislation spoke about an 18% reduction of throughput in these communities. So we went from a reduction in throughput um, to more of like a cap in, in capacity. So the legislation itself has been modified significantly to not necessarily reduce throughput, but just simply allow for there to be mostly a cap in these communities, and in some cases, some businesses will take a hit. The, the reasoning there as well is, for example, organics recycling is something that is new to the city. When organics recycling started, um, we needed new trucks to move around the city of New York, and those trucks started dumping their trash in our community. So we actually saw an increase in truck traffic in the South Bronx, um, North Brooklyn, and Southeast Queens related to organic. So what we're doing now is any new ideas or initiatives by the city of New York, um, we wouldn't necessarily be the first choice. So these communities won't be the first choice to move this trash around. Hi, Dan. I'll let you go after this. But I guess That's what I'm cool. just trying to get at is, is the actual amount of trash dumped in these communities going to go down? Uh, in, yes. Uh, there is, there is going to be uh, some two transfer stations in the Bronx that are going to see a reduction, an actual reduction. Um, there are a lot more in Brooklyn and some in Queens. So in some cases, for example, if a, if a waste transfer station is handling 1,000 tons of trash, a 33% reduction will make it so that they're handling 666 tons uh, of trash. Um, and in that case, whatever, however many trucks would have handled that trash would no longer be in that community, for example. Um, but those are in cases where transfer stations are working at capacity. Uh, most of the sites in the city of New York are not working at capacity. Um, of the 40,000 tons that exist in the city of New York, only about 20,000 tons are actually used. So we have almost 50% of capacity in the city of New York that is unused capacity. I have one Airbnb. All right. One more for trash. Uh, okay, so anyone, thank you. anyone else on trash? Uh, Jeff. Was it, was it weakened in Queens? I mean, are you, are you selling out the, the residents of Queens here and mm. allowing more no, so in Queens, uh, in, during the original swamp plan that was made by Bloomberg, they identified three communities as overburdened communities or environmental justice communities, or the three that I just spoke about. Um, but since then, Southeast Queens has actually gone from a district that handled about 12% of the city's trash to closer to 6 7% of the city's trash. So they significantly lessened the amount of capacity that exists in that community. So the 33% cut was more of a reflection of the amount they handled citywide as opposed to um, are watering down, I guess. So um, I want to be clear, we 20,000 tons get handled in North Brooklyn alone, 40%. So we just saw that, that one as an, it's an extreme case there. In other places, it was a problem, but it's an extreme case in North Brooklyn, so we wanted to make sure that we, we, we noted that. Am I okay? okay. Right. Sorry, looking at the staff members. Anyone else? Great. Thanks, Good. Antonio. All right. I mean, Love clearly, you. given how complicated this is and the yeah. level of detail of questions, it shows why it's taken a very long time to sort yeah. this out, why the bill has changed a lot, how the sanitation industry has changed a lot, yes. recycling, organics, uh, construction and, and debris, mm -hmm. all these things have factored into how we've gotten to where we are today, but it's still a very good yeah. day. Thank, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Courtney. Yeah. Very yeah. Um, can you say definitively that that had absolutely no impact on how quickly this legislation was given to the process? That's question one. And question two. So when was the bill introduced? When was the bill introduced? No. No, it was introduced before that. Yeah. In May. Well, I want to, before I answer your question, I actually need to know how long, because I actually did think it took a normal amount of time through the legislative process. Okay. 
keep going with your question. Uh, I have stayed at an Airbnb, uh, I, I believe in, uh, uh, in the Carolinas uh, on Cape Hatteras or, or that area uh, with my ex-boyfriend. Didn't work out. Um, <laughs> Airbnb, the Airbnb was nice though. <laughs> that Airbnb, we were staying above someone's, it was like a separate car garage and they built a little apartment above where the cars were parked so it wasn't part of their house or whatever so it was very nice um, uh, on the first part about HTC um, uh, this was done on the merits uh, the the council has talked about these issues for a very long time again the number of constituent complaints that we get on short-term rentals is overwhelming. The number of examples in my own district that I've given here today, and there are many more examples, of illegal hotels being run outside of a level of transparency and accountability uh, shows that we needed information uh, from these companies to be able to do our job. And uh, I will just reiterate to what I said to Henry, which is they did not want to play ball with us. They wanted to short circuit us and go to the state legislature and change the multiple dwelling law and not hand over any information and then attack us by using talking points which are untrue to try to undermine the legislative process here. That is what happened. And I just wanna add that when you talk about trying to make a deal, you know, in other cities, they've also launched lawsuits against municipal bodies who try to regulate the industry. So in order to make a deal with someone, you need them to come to the table, and that wasn't happening. These conversations about this bill started before the piece of legislation was introduced in June. So we met with NYCLU, we met with Airbnb multiple times, even before the legislation was introduced to make sure that we were listening to them as we drafted the legislation. And yes, I've stayed at Airbnb in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a great state. It's lovely, lovely. You guys aren't even familiar with Nike we set. We, we I'm, I'm not, we she might be. Do you, do you want to talk on that? Sure, sure, I will say that we heard, uh, and they testified at the hearing, and so we made sure that we contacted them, and we actually put things in the bill that we thought strengthened the security piece that a lot of people were worried about, and that is related to the two pieces of legislation that the speaker mentioned earlier in the press conference, and really also any, personal information collected is gonna be fully protected by those laws, and then we have also have the state's FOIL law. So we put, we actually added things in the bill since those conversations that I think strengthened it and addressed those very issues. They called it inadequate. There are lots of people who think what we do is inadequate. <laughs> Yoav. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but my understanding was the, the fines associated with the Sure, and I, I know we have some of the, the staff here who worked on that with us. Uh, initially, it was five to $25,000, depending on how egregious the violation was. Um, when we thought about what we could potentially find Airbnb on and how it could add up, that's why we lowered it to 1500 yeah. it, seemed to, it seemed too high? Even 1500 could result in a lot of money that is gonna be going against Airbnb. Now it's 1500 flat or? $1,500 flat. Were they happy with us lowering those fines? I don't know. It's first um, right? Knocked down from 5000 to $25,000. Okay. I, I, I don't know if they commented on that on their conference call. It's 1500 or uh, the amounts per, the amounts made on each listing, whichever is greater than 1500 Yeah. You'll see that in the bill. Um, I want to open it up to all questions, so if people want to, but we can keep talking about Airbnb, but yes, Erin. And not just landlords, there, there are plenty of people currently who will get an apartment and will then, in their name, and then will then use that apartment as basically a warehoused 
room that they keep Airbnb being out. So it's not even the, in many instances, it's not even the landlord of the building that's doing it. In many instances, in an individual building, which is why you get complaints from tenants inside of a building where the landlord's not participating in it, you have a tenant who will go live with someone else or live with their family or have another apartment somewhere and will be warehousing a unit in a small building and be uh, constantly renting it out over and over and over again, never really living there. And so it's not just about landlords, it's about anyone who is participating in taking those type of units off of the market. Uh, Councilor Carnegie has a bill that has been written about. We're continuing to talk about that, so I don't have anything to say on that because I still have to talk with him about it and understand the changes that he wants to make and understand the bill. On the first part, of, I'm going to get to you, Will. I'll call you next. Uh, on the on the first part of it, um, there are currently rules. If you have if you have an apartment, if you're going to not be in that apartment for a certain number of days, you can Airbnb out your your apartment. Is that true? Yes. Uh, if you're, if it's not that you can rent out for less than 30 days. You have to be in, and you have to be in there, and it can't be for more than two people. So there, there are, there are rules in place. They don't want to abide by those rules, which is why they want to go change the multiple dwelling law. We can't, we can't change the multiple dwelling law. The multiple dwelling law is what spells this out. But what has happened right now, my understanding, and Carlina, feel free to jump in here. The Office of Special Enforcement are really trying to go after the really bad actors that have entire buildings or multiple apartments in a building. They're not going to an individual who goes away from Memorial Day weekend and rents out their apartment on Airbnb and is doing it randomly. That's not what OSC has been focusing on. I mean, technically under the law, they're not supposed to do that, but that's not what's happening right now. So. Again, there's, there's what happens in reality, and there's what Airbnb's talking points are to, to try to score political points against them not wanting any further regulation or transparency. Right, so my question, I guess, is, you know, regardless of where the enforcement is focused, that person who goes away from Memorial Day weekend would you be open to just clarifying a lot and say that's what you're It's not up to us, it's the multiple dwellings law. Who's in your, your position on that personally? My position on that personally is, I feel of two minds, honestly. Uh, really, I, I, I feel for individuals who are not being egregious and who are not uh, taking advantage of this and creating deleterious um, situations in their building. I also understand, and, you, we, and this is part of what this bill came out of, you hear from people all the time in co-ops and condos and rentals. I'm paying X amount of money in my rent. This is not the person Airbnb. This is the person who's not Airbnb. And the person living next to me is Airbnb their apartment out twice a month, three times a month. Not all the time. Five times a year, eight times a year, whatever the amount is. Then the person says, why is it fair that people are coming in and out of my building with keys? They don't live here. They're trudging through with bags. They're being loud because they don't live here full time. So they are behaving in a way like this is a hotel when it's not. I have children, I'm a senior citizen, I have a health condition, I pay a good amount of rent to live in this apartment. Why is it fair that someone can just use our building as a hotel whenever they want? And that's why I agree with that. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't like it if the, if the apartment next to me two, three, four, five times a month, some was coming in with bags with keys to the building and I didn't know who they were and the super didn't know who they were and the owner didn't know who they were and the other people in the building didn't know who they were. It's not fair. And, and some of these, the landlords that, or the mostly in, in my district, what I've seen are landlords who have very sophisticated operations in these buildings who are renting out these apartments illegally and taking over common spaces that are supposed to be available to the tenants for washing machines and things that are typically available to someone who is running a hotel. So yes, uh, it's sometimes the, the common New Yorker, but many times, especially in my district, these are landlords who are taking rent regulated units out of the housing stock because they'd rather get a lot more money per night. 
Okay, let's, unless we have more Airbnb questions, I wanna allow any other questions on anything. Will. So before you finish your question, I would not frame your question that way about me giving in to demands of acquiescence. I'm not sure that's an objective way to answer this question. Council Rivera and I talk about land use items like I do with every member. It's not about acquiescence. It's about listening to the member. It's about negotiating. It's about hearing from the community. So if you want to re-ask the question, I think that's a kind of an unfair frame to the question you want to ask. Go ahead, Will. She hasn't made a demand of me. Or, or you know, the request. Whatever, whatever, you, know, I, I, I mean, you mean like a conversation, a negotiation? Yes. Okay, you, yes. You so I, I have conversations with every member here on land use items in their district. I understand what those uh, issues are. And uh, we always try to balance what those concerns are and the wider effect it's gonna have on the city of New York and on the local community. We are not at the point where we have a final decision yet. She has been negotiating, I don't wanna speak for her, but my understanding from my conversations with her, from my conversations with the administration, she has been having good faith negotiations with the administration, asking for some reasonable things, and they're gonna see if they can get there. So I can't comment on where we are because negotiations aren't done. But she and I speak almost every single day about this. She has shown a great level of flexibility and of thoughtfulness and understanding the real value of the tech hub on 14th Street and what that would do for the entire city of New York, especially for young people of color who need training and want jobs, while at the exact same time having development concerns for the surrounding community and trying to balance those things. That's not a remarkable thing, um, is trying to balance those concerns. And so we're going through that process together. But there's no acquiescence involved. It depends on the neighborhood. It depends on the district. Every neighborhood's different. Every district's different. There are certain neighborhoods that can very easily absorb more density, uh, whether it be on um, avenues or whether it be on uh, in certain areas where the FAR is higher under current zoning or where you've seen uh, more density build up without much of an effect on the community. You know, these things can't be talked about in a vacuum. When we talk about density, and we do need to build more housing, when we talk about density, you're not just talking about density. You're talking about traffic, you're talking about school seats, you're talking about parks, you're talking about subways, you're talking about all of those things where housing doesn't happen on its own, it has an effect on all these other things. So every single community across the city is different. When we talk about East New York, talking about East New York is not the same thing as talking about the East Village or Corona. It's different when you go around the city. And so there's no singular principle you use. You go through and you look at what, ha what has happened in those communities and how you balance all of these things. Uh, it's, it's possible, it depends on the issue. Um, but it's not about me overruling, it's about the, the, the membership of the body feeling a certain way. You know, everything we do here uh, is really done by consensus on, on most things. And so it wouldn't just be me, it would also be other members, whether it be the land use chair, the zoning chair, members of those committees, who, would, who could say this project has real value and the concerns that are being talked about uh, do not outweigh the benefits of this project. And so that would be a collective conversation we would have in conference and the committee process, and then we'd figure it out. But again, I just wanna, you know, it sounds like you want me to, to, to say something to give a definitive answer about this generally. Every project's different, every neighborhood's different, every financing is different. Certain projects have lower AMIs, which communities need. Certain projects have public open space or get more school seats. There's no way to give you a singular answer. It depends on the project. Rosa. Um, yesterday you were out on the steps saying Dan Daniel Panelino should be fired. I, want, I think it was the first time you said it publicly. I'm wondering if you've come to that. And also, if you think the mayor has lost touch with urgency on this, if he should be worried about his legacy on police accountability. 
I saw that his spokesperson said today that the mayor and the administration uh, now agreed that it's taken too long. So I, I don't know where I saw that reported, but I did see that today. And it has taken too long. Uh, Daniel Pantaleo should not be on the police force. He definitely should not have gotten any overtime, an increase in salary, while there is a potential pending Department of Justice investigation of civil rights abuses to him, and he's seeing an increase in salary from the NYPD when a family and a city and a community is mourning. Gwen Carr and the Garner family have waited far too long for justice. And they aren't the only folks that have waited far too long for justice. On this individual circumstance, I think it's taken far too long. I know that he was asked about this by Errol on Monday night when he was on New York One. Um, I don't remember exactly what he said, uh, but it shouldn't have taken this long. That's sort of the period. It shouldn't have taken this long. And we shouldn't have to wait till September for disciplinary, disciplinary proceedings to begin. It's taken far too long. I felt heartbroken seeing Gwen Carr yesterday talk about this and the amount of pain that she still has. There were tears in her eyes when she was talking about her son. It's unfair. And uh, Pantaleo uh, should be terminated. And any officer who was involved in misconduct around this should not be on the force as well. Uh, Samar? Well, I mean, just following up on that, do you think the mayor's two different grandchildren might be two different policies? Depends what policy we talk about. I mean, it, that's a broad, that's a broad question. Uh, I mean, I can try to give you an answer, but it could be a long answer because it's, I think it's a big issue about police accountability and reform in New York City. The vast, vast, vast majority of the police officers in New York City are doing a, a good job and are protecting communities, and crime is at an all-time low. At least last year, recorded crime was at an all-time <laughs> low, and the men and women of the NYPD deserve an enormous amount of credit for that, as well as the changing in strategies at the top level of the NYPD. So whether it be the NCO program, the neighborhood uh, coordination uh, program for getting officers in communities, that's a very good thing. Um, and so there are plenty of policies, the bias training that has been talked about and reported this week, that's a very good thing. The, de the decrease in stop, question, and frisk where it was being done in an out of control way, which was affecting primarily young men of color in New York City, that is a good thing, the change in that. Are there other things that we should continue to look at and do? Absolutely, one of the biggest things is there needs to be transparency around disciplinary actions that are taken. Uh, and you know, there's a disagreement of whether or not state law allows that. Uh, we need to see a real push to get that law changed if it's needed, to actually have more transparency when certain officers who have done things are still on the force. You saw what happened to James Blake outside of the Grand Hyatt on 42nd Street, and we need to be able to figure out, have these officers who have been involved in these incidents have previous incidents. We look back, you look at Pantaleo's record. There were multiple civilian uh, complaint review board complaints against him in the years prior, and we still don't have have a departmental disciplinary proceeding moving forward against him. There is a better way to do this. And so I think this council has actually been one of the leaders on talking about how you police marijuana, how you do all sorts of other things in a more fair and equitable way in New York City, primarily for communities of color. Again, most of those things sort of absolve the mayor of responsibility. They don't absolve the mayor of responsibility. I'm not standing here absolving the mayor of responsibility. Well, I mean, do you think I'm being critical. I'm saying that there have been some, I think, very transformative things, which the NYPD and the administration deserve enormous credit for. There are other things where they've fallen short. And where they've fallen short, there are plenty of council members who will tell you they've fallen short and will speak out on that. I mean, it's an issue by issue basis, which is why I said 
I can't give you one broad answer on, on policing in New York City and accountability in New York City and police reform in New York City. But I can tell you that there are areas I think that I personally am happy about where we've seen progress, and I think it's made a tremendous difference. And even when they've done those reforms, crime has still gone down. So it shows you can still reform how we police and still have crime go down and have summonses go down. And there are other areas that have been lacking. And you are going to, you've seen it, I think, through Chair Richards. Uh, chairing uh, public safety hearings this year and being very vocal about areas where he thinks the NYPD needs to do better. And I'm, of course, always happy to tell you how I feel uh, on these issues, but I think, I think that's it. Uh, uh, just uh, any other topic before we go? I don't really have much of an update on it. The more the merrier. I support congestion pricing. Thank you, Uber. Bye. Uh, I want to answer this. Uh, that organization is not going to be receiving funding from the city council. Uh, yes, let me elaborate. That organization is not going to receive funding from the city council. Uh, after uh, acquiescing to Will Bredeman's article in Cranes, um, uh, we, uh, we went back and we looked, and we still believe that, and it's complicated, but we believe that from our vetting perspective, and we're gonna take another look at how we vet things here at the council, and how we look at addresses, and how we look at all sorts of things, but we don't believe that there was anything nefarious going on. We weren't able to uncover anything nefarious. Councilmember Joni is the only Albanian American elected in the entire state of New York to public office. So Councilmember Joni advocates, of course, for the Albanian American community, given the historic nature of his candidacy and of being an elected official. This uh, organization uh, came to Councilmember Joni and said, we don't want to be a distraction. We care about getting uh, resources to the Albanian American community in New York City. There are other good organizations in New York City that still provide services. And so we are now having a conversation about, and we are vetting, uh, other organizations that provide services to the Albanian American community in New York City uh, to be able to still show support of that community. Well, at the exact same time, not allowing this to, to be a distraction. Um, I'm really actually proud of the budget we passed. I'm proud of the number of organizations we've helped. I'm proud of all the good groups that we fund. Um, but, uh, but that's where we are today on that. I don't, I, I, uh, we were not able to uncover anything nefarious, illegal, or untoward that happened here. The optics were not good optics. It's true, it's, it, they weren't. Uh, but we, we, we went back and vetted again. We went back and looked at it again. There was nothing here that made us think that there was anything untoward going on. But at the exact same time, it is really important when we are allocating taxpayer dollars that we are mindful, not just of whether or not there's something uh, nefarious going on, at the exact same time, the, the public perception is really important as well because we are allocating taxpayer dollars. And so we, we have to take in multiple factors uh, when we do that. Councilmember Joni uh, is, is, is happy and proud to move this to another organization because what he cares about is delivering to the Albanian American community, which he proudly represents. And so that is what we're gonna do in the assistance. That, that organization is not gonna get that money. We are going to pull it back and look at other potential organizations that serve the Albanian American community who will get that money. So the association has people? Excuse me? It has members. Uh, it's my, of course, it's my understanding that it has members, it has a board, it has members. It's, you know, some of the things, well, but no, but some of the, it's not just this organization, I'm not gonna talk about other ones, but it's not just this organization. There are a lot of organizations in New York City that do great work that don't have a paid staff that are run by volunteers and a volunteer board, and they're not bad groups, 
um, and they do good community work. That's, I believe, one of these groups, um, is my understanding, and there are lots of organizations that are like that, and they serve a diverse and disparate community throughout New York City. Okay, we're gonna finish up here, Will. I don't know enough about it, and what I mean by that is, I read some of the articles around it, but I was a little confused by the whole thing. I mean, I read about the Squitieri's, I read about, of course, the Kira Feldman pieces in Voice of America and ProPublica, which taught me a significant amount about what we need to do in the commercial carding industry. Um, I believe Councilmember Jonah answered, I think, this question uh, to Errol on New York One, um, but I don't know enough about it, you know, Given that you're asking, maybe it wasn't good optics, but I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think that he was. I haven't had a conversation with him about this particular thing. Um, we've been focused on trying to figure out how to allocate this money, Courtney, and then we're done. It's been a long press conference. Do I subscribe to it? Read it? I'm not on his list. Okay. I don't receive it. Did you read the one last week? Were you offended by it? And do you think that he should be reprimanded in any way for that? So um, I think I've answered this to you yesterday uh, off camera. And so I'm happy to answer it on camera. Uh, I, we have a uh, process here. And let me explain the process because I think it is really important because I've been seeing, this is not me criticizing anyone here, but I've been seeing tweets and stories about this meeting and hearing that was had. And I, some of the things I saw around this was the council's not being transparent related to the hearing and what it's about. So do we have anyone from the general counsel's office here? Okay, so let me do my best. You may want to try to get someone if they're here just so I don't screw this up, but let me try to, to explain to you why we do things the way we do here. Any type of complaint could come in against any council member. And the first thing is we have to determine whether or not that complaint is substantiated, whether or not there is validity to that complaint. I'm not commenting on the current process because the committee handles that and I'll explain why I can't comment on it and why I couldn't comment it earlier this year when there was another standards and ethics hearing which resulted in action that took place that was recommended by the committee and voted on by the committee. The reason why is, number one, we have to protect the complainant. We have to protect the person who's come forward and made a report. And if this council, if me as speaker, start to talk about that and confirm things to you all, it could make the complainant feel like their potential confidentiality and privacy is not being respected, which could then have a chilling effect for other people in the future, feeling like they can come forward to have confidential conversations, wondering is the speaker of the city council going to go to the press and immediately talk about it before I'm interviewed, before the committee can look at it, before all of that. So we do it in a way, number one, protect the complainant is the first thing. And to ensure that we don't have any chilling effect and everyone feels like they're gonna be able to talk about it in a protected way before people are talking to the press about it. We have to gather the facts first before we do that. The committee has to gather the facts first and have a conversation with the lawyers here for the, that's number one. Number two, the reason why I can't tell you which council member it is is because in this instance, I believe the committee remarked that there is gonna be an investigation going forward. I haven't been involved in those conversations. I wasn't in the meeting. I haven't talked to the chair about it. I am separate from that. The committee will make a determination 
and, and they are an independent committee and there is no influence from me on that committee on what they decide to do and what they do is an executive session and they voted on that in a public way earlier this year as per the rules of the council. But the reason why I can't comment on whoever the council member is, even if they confirm who they are, the reason why I can't do it is because for precedent reasons, if there is a complaint against a council member in the future that is brought forward, and there could be in the future, if that complaint ends up being unsubstantiated, it would be unfair to the due process of that council member. Anyone, this is not me in any way minimizing a victim or a complainant in any way because they are the most, we, that's the first thing I said is protecting them, their confidentiality and not having a chilling effect. But the second thing is if there is a, a complaint against a council member and we realize as a, as a, as a body that it's not substantiated, it's not real, it didn't happen or it's not, it didn't happen the way it said it happened, you have a feeding frenzy going after a member, asking them to comment something that may not have happened. And so it is balancing due process for that council member until we figure out if there's a substantiation of the complaints, at the same exact time, protecting complainants and victims and having a level of confidentiality. The only thing uh, I will say, and I say this in a general way, not about this individual circumstance, there are a lot of we hear this not just in the city council, but in private industry and in government. When people come forward, when victims come forward, when complainants come forward, they are scared that, that it's immediately gonna end up in the press when they're not ready for it to end up in the press. They are scared. At some point, they may wanna talk about it with the press. And so I always have to balance how do I ensure that if someone's coming forward and being honest with us and participating in an investigation and we want them to be forthcoming, we want them to be able to talk about this in a free way, we hear all the time that people say, is the press gonna find out about this right away? I mean, victims say this because they don't wanna be on, te on television right away. They don't want their name in print right away. They're processing what happened to them. They're figuring it out. And so as much as you all want us to immediately say it was this council member who was, uh, the allegations were this, and we, we have a process here. And, and I have to stand by that process, which balances due process and confidentiality and not having a chilling effect for victims who wanna come forward. And I think that that was left out of much of the, much of the reporting that I've seen around this over the last 48 hours, that this is not, it's not us, trying to hide anything. We've, we've handled this in an expeditious manner. We have brought it to the committee right away. We've handled this totally by the book. And you, of course, of course, want all the information. We can't give you all of that information in the time frame that you all want because we have other considerations at play that we have to take consideration of in the process. It's a little complicated because there are, it depends on what the allegations are. So there are some things where they can potentially remain confidential, but on other things, if there is something criminal that has gone on or if someone has violated city law or state law or federal law, they can't remain confidential because someone's broken the law and that's been brought to us. It's a case by case basis. So what do you mean in a case like that? I can't comment on this case. It's a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on what comes to us. I mean, as you saw, has been pointed out in the rules of the council, there's a wide things that the Standards and Ethics Committee looks at, and so it depends on, on what it is in there, but I can tell you that I feel, and again, I haven't been involved, I wasn't in the meeting that took place. From what I know, in a general way, I feel very confident in Chair Matteo and how he's handled this. I feel very confident in the general counsel's office here at the city council, and I feel confident that we are handling this in an in a appropriate way 
to both balance due process and complainants who want to come forward and need to come forward and need to be able to tell their stories. And so that's what we always have to do here. Thank you. Thank you all very much.